Hello, everybody, and welcome to the HTML All the Things podcast, episode number 15, Developer to CTO with Azar Zuberi. I'm your host, Matt Lawrence, and I'm joined again by my co-host, Mike Coran. What have you been up to this week, Mike? Yeah, hey, Matt. Uh, so this week, we had another meeting uh, just before that, that last week ended about uh, Hat and you know, you and I kind of discussed on where we want to, when we want to launch. And I think we set ourselves up for around the Halloween time. So we're moving forward on that. Um, this week is going to be heavy on doing a lot of Vue.js stuff, the, con- the navigation stuff, the controls for Hat in general. Uh, so that's going to be cool. Stay tuned for that. I'll definitely be posting some stuff on Instagram, Twitter, all that stuff. So check it out. Uh, other than that, that's about it. What about you, Matt? Uh, Same sort of thing. So today was sort of a deadline for, so like you said, we were discussing deadlines for the full site, but I had a kind of a personal deadline where before we just kind of had the, like, I guess we'd call it the collection page, or we kind of refer to it internally as the hub. So the hub is sort of like where you see all the posts. So it'll be like, oh, I can, you know, see all the podcast posts and all the blog posts, all the guides, all the whatever, and then you can, you know, click into one. So when you click into one, we call those the full pages and, you know, they're of various types, podcasts and templates and stuff like that. So I was making the skeletons uh, for those. And by skeletons, I mean, basically it, you know, it's legible. Mike can put information into it dynamically so we can do any sort of database work or logic work with like actually like programming it, like doing the back end stuff. Uh, and he can actually put that in and then he can actually read it and it looks okay and everything's in its place. It's just, you know, I didn't do padding. I didn't do typography. I didn't do any of the fancy stuff. It's like, let's, this is kind of how we got it going. Cause we were stressing too much about the looks I think on the hub. And so this time we're like the heck with it. Let's get the, let's make sure all the words wrap. Let's make sure we can see everything. Let's make sure it looks okay and make sure images work. And then let's just, you know, full steam ahead it because the next one I can just sit there and tweak and tweak and tweak for like a week or two. And it doesn't really bother Mike. And then, you know, he can, but like, like now it's not bought, like barring him. It's not like stopping him from going ahead because before there were no full pages. So that, that's just kind of how we pushed, uh, push that forward. Um, so this is again, a bit of a different, uh, different episode. This is our second interview episode. So, uh, this part is pre-recorded, and then we'll be going to uh, a separate recording of the actual uh, phone call slash interview that we had, uh, here. But, uh, so in this episode, we sit down with Azar Zaberi to discuss his journey from developer to chief technical officer of content link, a cloud-based marketing media management and distribution service for brand vendors, optical retailers, and service providers. So we work with Azar for the past few years, offering infrastructure planning and web development services on a variety of projects. When we started working with the czar, he was still playing the role of the developer, but quickly transitioned to his newly found CTO position. So let's jump into this interview section to learn more about his unique professional journey. All right, everybody, we have Azar on the line, but before we jump into that, we always go through our segments, of course. So segment number one, introduce yourself. That'll be Azar obviously introducing himself. Segment number two, a little backstory. Segment number three, our connection. Segment number four, running a company. And then, of course, the recurring segment, web news, incomplete ecosystems. So I'm going to hand this off to Azar now and give us a little backstory of your background and you know how you got to today. Yeah, well, uh, thanks for having me on the podcast here. This is actually a first for me, so uh, you know, I, I uh, hope that I uh, you know do this satisfactorily. Uh, so, as uh, you just uh, mentioned, my name is Azar Zuberi. I'm uh, the founder, one of the founders and CTO of ContentLink.com. We are a SaaS business based in uh, San Diego, California. Uh, you know, I think uh, the topic of this conversation is going to be around my journey li- journey line. Uh, going from a developer into a CTO type of a role, and I look forward to talking to you guys about that. Awesome. Well, we're really glad that you uh, really glad that you came on. Um, so I guess we can jump right into then uh, segment number uh, two here. So a little backstory. So uh, what would you say uh, is the most important topic or lesson that you learned in your schooling when it comes to being a developer? Yeah, you know, that's a really good question. And this will probably date me a little bit uh, because, you know, my schooling was a little while ago. Um, And I had to really think about this, uh, this topic, uh, you know, as I was preparing for this podcast, you know, uh, at the time, I probably wouldn't have said this, but looking back at it now, it is all about adaptability and being able to learn and not so much about, you know, the, the topics that are presented to you, like, you know, the actual curriculum itself. 
but just being able to uh, learn quickly and pick up concepts fast. And that, you know, as we know, the world that we live in, you know, every time you blink your eye, there's some new stack and some new, uh, you know, framework out there. And it's really impossible to learn everything and be a master of everything, uh, you know, up front. So it is about adaptability. You know, some of the, as far as, you know, getting specifics, I think, uh, you know, when I was starting off in computer science, a uh, big requirement, I don't know if they still do that, is, uh, you know, getting at the machine level, like assembly language programming, programming for the hardware. Uh, you know, I, that really helps you, a developer really uh, understand what it exactly is, you know, when you're allocating memory or, you know, assigning a variable, what exactly is happening at the machine level. And ultimately that, you know, people that were really good at that ended up writing really tight code. Uh, data structures and algorithms, I think, was another uh, key takeaway, which I hated at the time. But, uh, you know, in retrospect, I think that was a very in important topic just to be a you know robust developer all around. Uh, it's really interesting that you mentioned the uh, the assembly part there, because one of the things that Mike and I had discussed on one of our uh, prior episodes was that we kind of like where whereas we didn't go to school directly for for web development, we ended up having that assembly and sort of you almost learn how to learn, I guess. So it's like you like you said, you're you're quick on your feet, but you kind of start with that like assembly is the base of the base, right? So it's it's like you know you start at that base of the, of the like really base kind of code, and then you kind of like build your skills up and you learn how to learn new things, so that when the world, which as it is, is rapid fire, you can kind of keep up and keep you know keep trucking on and not kind of get stuck in you know, whatever language that you're stuck in or whatever framework that you're stuck in, if it like loses support, you're not stuck in some way where you're like, well, uh, now I guess, <laughs> I guess that, I guess that ends my career as a developer. So yeah, it's very, it's really key to, yeah. to, to learn, like to learn how to learn. Exactly. And, you know, I'll, I'll give you one example of that. Uh, uh, back in the day, you know, before there was uh, smartphones like iOS and Android was around, you know, there was this thing called J2ME and that was like going to be the first, uh, you know, mobile operating system, if you will. Uh, for a lot of these, you know, like commodity uh, feature phones. And I spent a lot of time learning J2ME. It was like, you know, I spent like, you know, all my free time and just becoming an expert on it. You know, I, I built a couple of games and entered a couple of contests, uh, you know, didn't win anything. Uh, but it was just, you know, that was where my passion was. And literally overnight, you know, when I, uh, Apple released uh, their first uh, iPhone and then Android you know, came up at their heels really uh, shortly thereafter, J2ME evaporated overnight. And, uh, you know, I kind of like sat back and looked at it. I was, like, I was like, holy shit, you know, this is, uh, uh, I spent so much time on it and it's gone. It wasn't a complete loss because, you know, th some of those skills are portable over uh, into, uh, you know, say Android and uh, other uh, frameworks. But just this idea of like locking yourself down into one technology, I think was, uh, it, in my case, at least it was a bit of a mistake. I, I, I kind of, I kind of have a similar story as well. And I bet you a lot of developers do as well, where, I mean, I, it wasn't, it wasn't years and it wasn't that much time, but, uh, as Mike knows, we were in the very, very early days, we were looking at, oh, we can port websites and web apps to mobile. And I, I was, and still am a huge Blackberry fan. So I was like, man, I'm using BB 10. Hi. Let's, let's use, let's use BB 10. And so I use, I like learned how to make their user interfaces and i remember i remember being in i think it was i think it was probably about four or five months in and i remember standing in line at the bank and and a i think it was a tweet or a, a message came across and it was like uh facebook is now no longer like you know supported on your phone oh. and i was like <laughs> uh i'm gonna switch to android and that was the end of that development cycle and the de end of me using bb10 sadly so uh, I think all of us have a story like that, but yep. you take something away from it and it helped me with, it helped me with kind of understanding interfaces a little more. So, you know, as long as you learn something, I guess, you know, you keep, keep trucking on. Uh, exactly. Uh, exactly. Uh, moving on to, I guess, to the second question here. Um, how important would you say was your first job as a developer in defining your coding style slash knowledge base? So, you know, uh, that's also an interesting question. You know, the first job as a developer, I ended up going through a program that offered a, a you know co-op program through my university uh, in uh, in Canada at University of Victoria. And so, if I look back at that, you know, my first job in that, uh, you know, as a developer was really a firmware development. I was working at a you know at a telescope facility in Hawaii, and we were programming a holography system, a real time uh, uh, on a v VX Works. I think they're actually still around. It was like, you know, one of the few real-time operating systems and, you know, programming this uh, uh, data acquisition unit. 
And so, you know, this is coming back to that original conversation we had around firmware development or, you know, like machine level development where you just have to be like very tight, right? Like every bit counts, literally every bit counts. And so uh, that was, uh, you know, definitely, uh, you know, set up the baseline of how I would uh, write code in the future. And then, you know, shortly after that, about a year or so, uh, you know, I moved over into higher level uh, uh, development uh, endeavors, like, you know, doing just web development. But that always stuck with me, like just to know that even though there is a, say, you know, like automatic garbage collection, there's a virtual machine handling memory management, you still got to be aware of like, you know, there's a, you, you can't just have a, a loop where you're just allocating, uh, you know, variables or objects uh, indefinitely. There, there will be a breaking point. So you have to be very cognizant of what kind of hardware is running uh, the code underneath. And, uh, you know, I think that was uh, pretty instrumental in that. And I still think that way. And. Oddly enough, we've kind of come full circle in uh, you know the projects that we're doing with you now, which I'm sure we'll talk about, where hardware is an issue, and you know we want to make sure that the the code that we write is very tight and can run for extended periods of time. I think I think that's really I think that's really important uh, in in saying like real time like 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 you're, you're saying you kind of went from the real time OS to to actually moving on to like web development, which you know is totally a different world. Like a real time OS, I think we've mentioned on the show would be. The most simple example I could give to the audience would be something like a, a car alarm that literally sits there idle real time until somebody opens the door when they're not supposed to and then it just like triggers the alarm. But if it's, you know, if it keeps checking that, checking those doors, checking those doors, checking those doors, and there's some sort of, you know, something being stored in the background or it gets backed up, it might miss one of those doors opening because it's it was inefficient in some way. So that's really critical. But in the same breath, it's like, you know, you in web development, you have people using older computers, you have people using, we've had people come to us and say, we need this to work on dial up. Uh, like even today, like as, as soon as, or as like, I think five years ago, we had that as somebody came to us and was like, this needs to work on dial up. And it's like, okay, well, we're going to have to uh, really like, just like strap it down. Whereas a lot of guys will kind of dive into the framework world and then not really understand like kind of the back end stuff, which I mean, obviously they're really versed in the frameworks, but well, you know, I'm glad you kind of brought up the dialogue because, uh, you know, we're kind of spoiled where we live, right? We've got, we kind of assume that network is ubiquitous and, uh, you know, computing power is, uh, you know, is is available to us. Uh, but you look at, you know, the rest of the world, especially when you start thinking global, you know, network is not necessarily ubiquitous and not everyone's got access to like, you know, I, I7, like, you know, a billion cores on a on a chip kind of system. So when we write apps and uh you know web applications and software in general for the global um uh audience it it all becomes a factor uh, absolutely and and even even something as simple as you know we're in an, an office where it's always connected um or or in your home which is already always connected but even just like a corporate environment in which security is a thing where it's like hey we can't have the network always on we can't have the internet access so it's like they're intentionally cutting themselves off like i mean the luxury is there let's say like the line could have been run by an isp but they are for a security reason not doing it so you you have to you know kind of think okay i need to have these assets offline i need to understand like i can't just keep pinging the cloud i can't keep talking to a cdn i have to make sure this works on board sort sort of thing right right exactly uh, so moving on to the uh, third question here, uh, when first starting out, uh, what were the popular technologies that you learned? So some examples would be Angular, Bootstrap, WordPress, etc. Oh man, I wish. And again, I'm going to date myself here. I wish we had access to Angular, Bootstrap, you know, these, uh, uh, the frameworks. <laughs> uh, the, the hot technology at the time was uh, Java applets. I remember that distinctly when I first saw a Java applet running in a browser, I was like, I was like, whoa, what the, you know, what's, what's this sorcery? Uh, the idea that, you know, you could download a utility app whenever you needed it and run it in your you know environment and then it was kind of gone after that um, and that was going to change the world and uh, you know we soon found out that it didn't change the world because uh, it was very cumbersome and uh, you know resource intensive I mean I, I wish someone would attempt to bring that back now I think there may be a, a case for bringing that rich uh, app environment back into the browser you know there might be another uh, you know pass that is as we know, everything that's old kind of comes back around eventually. Uh, so Java applets were hot. There was definitely, you know, this camp of uh, Java guys versus Microsoft guys when I was just, uh, you know, uh, starting off there. Um, 
Java applets, as we know, didn't really work out. But then Java, you know, quickly moved to the server in the you know with the you know the advent of like JSP. That was a big thing uh, right after. And, uh, you know, and that's kind of like what's matured until, uh, you know, what we see now on the server. Like now you've got these like, you know, industrial enterprise level uh, J2E, uh, uh, you know, containers and uh, app servers. Uh, the other, you know, the big thing, like I said, uh, Mono, I think, was just starting off there. That was like the open source version of Microsoft's equivalent of uh, Java. Uh, JavaScript was kind of interesting. It was around, but it was uh, really... If I recall correctly, you know, we were using it for like, you know, form validation, like validating form fields before submitting or like, you know, like stupid animation on a page. It was nowhere near as robust as what we see now where, you know, you can build like entire apps. And I mean, now with Node, you got JavaScript running up and down the stack, which is just, you know, phenomenal. Uh, for sure. Yeah. Like it's, 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 it's certainly, it certainly like has expanded its horizons, uh, like, like, like a lot in, in like just the last few years. And, and you can see that just by the popularity of the like the plethora of just like a bunch of frameworks and libraries and like apps that have come out that are built, you know, solely or mostly with JavaScript. It's really, really interesting. Um, one question actually I kind of thought of when, when you mentioned that was, would you say that when these technologies were sort of modernizing to let's say today's standards, would you say that, so right now, as we've said, it's, it's like fast paced. There's lots of frameworks and stuff coming out, you know, every day, essentially, would you say that back then when things were sort of becoming more standardized, more more up to today's standards, were things being released quicker back then to get to this point? Or was it slower and it's faster now, do you think? You know, it's it's a really good question. I uh, it, There was definitely, I was, I was seeing an uptick in like, you know, things that were available, but it was also a, a function of information that was available to us at the time. You know, the, the web was still, you know, nascent and, you know, there was a lot of content on there, but not nearly the amount that we see today, you know, I mean, I I don't know what the stats are. The amount of content that doubles, like, you know, on the web is, I think, happens like hourly or something. It's crazy. Um, but, uh, you know, uh, things that were being available, like all of a sudden the, the web was available. There was a browser. You could go out and research. There was, uh, you know, user groups starting to form and people collaborating online. And that definitely helped, uh, you know, advance some of the technologies. But uh, I don't think, if I, if I recall correctly, that it was anywhere near what we see today. I mean, as you guys know, every time, you know, you, you blink your eye or, you know, go to sleep at night, you wake up in the morning, there's like, you know, 10 different new frameworks that are popping up and, you know, you all of a sudden you have to be a master of them or you're going to get left behind. That's, uh, it, it is an interesting phenomenon. Most definitely. We see that uh, Mike and I will spend like a decent amount of time kind of browsing through the uh, I think it's the web design or the web development subreddit. I can't remember which one, but we'll kind of be on there and we'll see like one guy, one guy jokingly had a thread where he was like, I was, I've been on vacation for five days. Like, are we still using JavaScript? What's HTML? Is HTML on eight? Like what's going on here? So <laughs> like, and that was like the top comment or whatever for the day. So, uh, so obviously like, it, you know, everyone's, everyone's feeling the pressure, um, especially recruiters. I hear recruiters are having trouble keeping up with just even writing out their, like their you know requirements from companies because like they're like oh man now we need a new we need this new thing in our in our requirements from people and now we got to ask these questions and there's new questions to ask because it's new and it's just it's yeah. just craziness it's, just, it's <laughs> crazy it's crazy but it's a it's a thrilling time we live in also obviously because of that same reason exactly yeah like like who knows what'll be where we'll be in you know five ten years it'll it's it's gonna be it's gonna be an interesting interesting time especially with more things being connected to the cloud exactly. Uh, so I'll pass it off to Mike there for our third segment. Yeah, thanks, Matt. Uh, so, yeah, I just wanted to mention that the, fa the fact that um, we kind of had the same schooling starting up, right? Like we've talked about on this podcast a few times where we're, we're big proponents of like starting very low level. Like you were saying, like starting with, uh, with assembly, going to, you know, straight JavaScript and stuff like that. Uh, so that it's cool that we, we kind of, both had the same mindset both had the same schooling um, i i think I, I i knew that about you but i i, I forgot or something it's cool yeah yeah yeah, it's, yeah. well it's, yeah, it's awesome. good to reconnect on that topic yeah exactly so uh let's move on to segment three and that's our connection so um back when we were first starting out uh as digital dynasty design and we're still digital dynasty design on our service side so what what happened was we were kind of like in in a very early gro growth phase and we were starting out and we were building a uh, chrome application stuff like that um 
we're, we're kind of trying to find our niche and that seemed like a good way, a good area to go. And what we did was we kind of went on job boards, went on contractor boards and we posted our company. And eventually we got contacted by uh, Azar. And with that, I kind of want to ask, what was the reason you decided to choose us when we first started working together? Yeah, very good question. And uh, so, you know, similar to your journey line, uh, you know, we were starting off at the time. Content Link was, uh, uh, you know, very much uh, more than an idea. You know, we had like some uh, prototypes, some demos going on, you know, great response from the market. And it was time to actually build a, a solution. And so uh, as a t- CTO, I was looking for, uh, you know, d- different technology stacks, like, you know, what's going to serve us well, which is going to serve us well for a long period of time. Um, and uh you know, the nature of our business is just to, you know, take a step back. I'll let the, you know, give the viewers uh, or the listeners, uh, you know, kind of high level overview of what it is we do. So, you know, we're a SaaS business. We have a a digital asset manager on the, on the back end and we work in the optical retail space. So the idea is that we work with all the major brands, they upload all their content into our, uh, into our dam, uh, create playlists and push it out to our player app. The player app itself is, sits on a, uh, you know, interactive tablet at the point of sale in an optical store. So imagine if you're shopping for, you know, you go to your local lens crafters, you're shopping for Ray-Ban, you know, we'll put actually put a, a tablet right at the frame board, at the Ray-Ban frame board. And then that message is, uh, you know, pushed out by the brand managers and we have interactive tools built into it. Now, th- so that was a setup. And uh, I was thinking at the time, uh, you know, what is the technology stack to actually deploy the front end application? So we need a combination of hardware and software. And, uh, you know, just knowing the business that we're in, you know, the first thing that everyone goes to is obviously iPads. We'll just put iPads out there. And that was quickly a non-starter because the cost involved in deploying iPads, you know, especially when we talk about projecting out and thinking globally. Um, at the time, you know, we, uh, Android was a great uh, uh, contender also. So we were looking at Android. But I also wanted to do a little, something a little bit more cutting edge. So we started looking at Chrome to deploy this, to build uh, you know, web apps that can be wrapped natively as a Chrome app and then deploy on a Chromebook, which was just, you know, starting to, uh, uh, you know, become, more, come into its own. Uh, you know, there was a variety of devices available that we could have uh, chosen from. And so at that point, we had a, you know, basic app written and we needed to be able to, you know, wrap it as a Chrome app, a native Chrome app and deploy it. And so I went on the hunt, you know, looked online and uh, it was looking for uh, developers and uh, came across uh, you guys and came across a few other people uh, that I contacted right away. And, uh, uh, you know, what I liked about you guys was it was, number one was right away we got a response. And I think from the moment that I reached out to actually us talking was, I think, like within an hour kind of thing, if I, if I recall cor- correctly. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, I talked to, I think, I believe it was you, Mikhail. Uh, you know, we got on a Skype, had a quick chat. Uh, you guys seemed to pick up exactly what it is we were looking for. And uh, we were able to, like, you know, do a quick uh, test, quick prototype, uh, you know, right away, which kind of gave me more confidence. And then, you know, the way I operate is, uh, especially working with contractors, I always like to do a try before you buy. So, uh, you know, I do a small project with somebody, a new contractor, a new uh, dev shop. And if that works out well, then we increase the responsibility, increase the responsibility. And that's been, the, you know, I've been uh, uh, very thankful that I did find that posting of yours and reached out because it's been a great partnership so far. Yeah, no, for sure. It's been, it's been great for us too. And uh, yeah, it's as our uh, content link has been one of our biggest clients throughout this whole time. And I think how long has it been now? Has it been three years? It's gotta be close to three years. I was thinking about that too. It's yeah, uh, you know, time too. flies, yeah, right? But uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it's been great. <laughs> Yeah. And like, uh, I've definitely learned a lot from you, uh, with my coding style as well. And we've kind of, I think we've, we've got a good melt going with, uh, our whole stack, which is really interesting. And so you kind of, you kind of started to answer and almost answered this question. So I'm going to, I'm going to just move on to it since like, let's get it, let's get it done. Uh, what is your workflow and process for working with and hiring outsourced or offsite developers? Since I know most of our team is, uh, offsite, uh, especially the development team and the design team. Yeah. So, you know, the, the whole uh, de- keeping the development uh, team offsite is more of a necessity. You know, mm-hmm. I'm we're, we're a, uh, you know, we're a startup. We are, you know, self-funded startup, in fact. And, uh, uh, you know, I, we live in San Diego and I'm competing. You know, if I was to hire a development team locally, I'd be competing with like, you know, we have Intuit here, uh, Qualcomm, a bunch of defense industries, Sony, 
uh, and a bunch of like well-funded uh, startups, biotech startups, and uh, you know just IT startups. And so uh, you know, we had to as a as a CTO of a you know very lean uh, startup, I had to think about like you know how do I enable all this instead of and not just be in a position where I'm writing all the code myself because that's obviously not sustainable. Uh, so you know, I had to look. Elsewhere, and as I mentioned earlier, you know the uh, my you know my uh, uh, approach is always try before you buy, and uh, so that's the kind of the workflow. You know, I'll identify a small project. You know, if it it could be like okay, I need a, a custom analytics report, you know, written. So I'll find a, a Google Analytics developer either through word of mouth, LinkedIn, you know, just uh, you know, looking online and uh, connect with them. And if they uh, do a good job there, and they you know we feel like style wise uh, uh, we work together you know obviously timing is a you know time zone is a uh, is a factor uh, pricing is a factor uh, rates and all that so I think there's a you know bunch of factors that come together uh, but what this has forced us to do is like you know think about that geographical location isn't really a barrier uh, I mean I prefer to keep people in the same time zone North American time zone just because you know, I don't want to be the one that is up at 9 p.m. every night getting on a scrum call. And I don't want to have to have the developers, vice versa, get up at like 3 or 4 a.m. Uh, for extended periods of time just to like go through like, you know, uh, your, your daily stand-ups. So I want to be mindful and respectful of people. And I feel like, you know, working in the North American time zone is a, is a, is a factor there. But other than that, geographical boundaries are not really, uh, you know, that, that important. Like, as you know, we... I think we've, I've never met Matt and I've only met you uh, in person once and we've been working together fabulously for about three years. So that's, uh, you know, uh, kind of a lesson out there for other people thinking about creatively, how will they build their team if they can't afford a team locally to where they are? Yeah, totally. And that, that's what I kind of want to get, want, what people to get out of this is that lesson is uh, I think you've done a good job, like a really good job building that team. And we've been working together so well. To, uh, I think like, there was obviously some luck there, but I think you did a really good job in vetting me, vetting us, and vetting other people that we have worked with in the past. So I'm just I'm trying to learn from it, and obviously hoping other people will learn as well. Great. Um, yeah, uh, totally. And so that brings us to the to another question, and we kind of uh, started talking about this a little bit last week, and I said, you know what, let's leave it for the podcast. Um, and this is like something that. Uh, that's important with our team and maybe your competitors as well. It's kind of a versus thing. So what are the benefits of having that small development team and then versus an increasing your funding, you know, getting, getting an investor and hiring like a full 40 person staff and trying to build, you know, that ultimate application. Yeah. You know, one of the things that I, and <laughs> a lot of my, uh, uh, peer CTOs may disagree with this. Uh, mm -hmm. you know, I hate over engineered solution. I feel like, you know, when you get, to a certain uh, you know the size of a team, uh, you know you do you will get into over-engineered solution and unnecessary overhead. I'm all about you know keeping small uh, lean teams. Now you know the danger of a I'll, I'll talk about the danger first and then the benefits. Mm -hmm. One of the dangers of a small team is that uh, you know you if you don't have sufficient redundancy, then you might get you know you might uh, hose yourself. Like you know if a person like decides to go you know to a different opportunity or uh, you know just doesn't work out, then you're kind of like left sitting there. And, uh, you know, you have to pick up the slack yourself. Uh, the, the, the benefits do outweigh, you know, if you do build in some level of redundancy, just the ability to move fast, I think, is a huge, huge uh, uh, pro. And I've, you know, worked in larger uh, team environments myself as a developer, and I've lar uh, led larger teams in, uh, you know, the enterprise uh, uh, side of things. Um, and, you know, like I'll give you an example, like, you know, the last, before I started Content Link, I was working for an you know, enterprise software company, my organization directly, there was like, you know, 12 people, but then we were one part of a huge other organization that made things happen, you know, put, put the application, put the service out every year. Uh, and uh, there was this, you know, I used to look around the room and think like there was so much waste, uh, just, you know, the amount of communication that's required, the amount of meetings that need to happen uh, to get everyone aligned. Uh, you know, it becomes, at the end of the day, I felt that, uh, you know, in those large environments, you know, you, where you introduce a lot of bloat, you end up solving for management and not for the customer. Uh, you know, you end up solving, you know, introducing processes, uh, which the developers may not necessarily like or uh, care about or the way they work, just to be able to show 
management and leadership that, hey, you know, this is our workflow. Uh, I like smaller teams because the teams themselves can uh, introduce a workflow. They can say, look, you know, they come to me and say, look, you know, let's try to use this tool to manage this part of the project. Or, hey, you know, we're in a development cycle right now. Let's meet. You know, we'll have our daily standups and, uh, you know, uh, some period, period of a scrum. Or, you know, we're small enough right now where we don't even need to do scrum and we can just do daily standups and get through it. Uh, so I'm very uh, mindful of listening to the team uh, to de- drive the uh, the process and, of course, guide along, you know, with my experience that I've had where things I know may or may not work. Uh, but it is about all about uh, moving fast and being able to solve for the customer. Mm-hmm. Yeah, no, and I agree. And I like I like that you mentioned um, the the, um, the, sm- the smaller teams, the, the, the meetings, right? So we have the daily the daily standups, the daily scrums. Uh, they're really short. Like usually we can get away with something like a 10 minute daily meeting and then we move on with our tasks. And that's a huge, huge benefit in my eyes. Uh, I've, I've also worked on larger teams. I've also worked in larger companies and those like, you know, three, four meetings a day would eat up 40% of my time. So, oh yeah. Yeah. As you know, as a, as a line manager back in the day, you know, I remember like I was used to look at my calendar and it was, uh, you know, out of 40, you know, 40 to 50 hour work week, you know, I'd say 90% of the time was spent in meetings and you still have to do the rest of your work. And, uh, it's just, uh, you know, I feel like it's a lot of waste. So what I, you know, even with my partners and at content link, uh, you know, when I start seeing like, you know, there's calls to meetings, like recurring meetings, I, I always do push back and question that and say, you know, do we really need it? And if we do really need it, who really needs to be in on it? Mm-hmm. Uh, otherwise, I mean, it's so easy, easy to set up, you know, standing meetings, you know, every day where, People are just, you know, there to just talk to justify it to have the meeting. Yeah, yeah exactly. And uh, yeah, that, that it's definitely been working out for these three years. So can't uh, can't argue with that. So what's next? Let's see. Uh, so the next thing is, and you kind of touched on it just now, too. So what are some of your biggest challenges when you have an offsite uh, outsourced development team? I know you mentioned one of those being uh, redundancy. So how would you how would you maybe like combat that? So, you know, a developer is a developer out there. And, you know, again, like, you know, the tools that we have available to us, it doesn't really matter if they're out there or in-house. Like, if I need to, you know, talk to you, I, it's you're, you're one button away. I, I click on Skype. You know, if you're around, we jump on a call, have a chat, and, uh, you know, be done with it. It's like, you know, it would be very similar to me sticking my head in your office or your cubicle and be like, hey, Mikhail, let's talk about this. Uh, redundancy wise, I mean, that's, uh, not really, uh, uh, you know, a correlation of being outsourced. It's a, that's has direct impact on, uh, or it's tied to like how much funding a company has. Mm-hmm. So, you know, when we do need, uh, uh, more developers, uh, I mean, that's something that as, as a CTO and a owner of the company that I'm always looking at is, you know, okay, right now, uh, you know, we got two full stack developers. I, do I really need two? Or, yeah, maybe I need three. Um, and that's part of our, you know, when I talk to my partners about where we're going to invest our resources, that's part of the conversation, you know, okay, it's, it's, it's time to bring in, uh, you know, a while ago, we needed to bring in a content manager. So, you know, we had that discussion. So resources, that's an always an ongoing, uh, conversation. And that, you know, again, is not, I mean, obviously as a CTO, I'm responsible for staffing up and maintaining the, you know, the resources on the technical side. But as an owner of the company, I have to look at holistically also is it, you know, our, where we are today is our, uh, you know, resources best spent, is our money best spent on building up, you know, shoring up the dev team or is it bringing on more salespeople? So, I mean, I know I'm kind of di- digressing from the original question, but um, th- those are some of the challenges. Uh, the other challenge, you know, I t- t- uh, you know, this is more of a tactical challenge and I touched on this earlier is that, uh, you know, time zone difference. Because as we know, you know, we live in a global world and there's a lot of talent out there. You know, you get into Europe and Asia and, you know, Africa now, uh, Australia, they're all out there. But, uh, you know, I always like to maintain a healthy quality of life also for myself Mm -hmm. and the team. And so, like I said earlier, you know, I I don't want to have someone that's, you know, needs to get up at three in the morning every day to get on a call. Uh, You know, they'll do that for... Uh, you know, a few months, maybe six months, maybe a year, but eventually that gets old for anyone. So that's, uh, you know, one of the challenges that I see is like, you know, we do limit ourselves in uh, trying to find talent within like, you know, North American time zones. And that includes Canada, obviously, as you guys are, you know, I find Mexico is a great place for that as well. Great resources, a lot of talent out there. Um, 
uh, and other than that, I mean, other like there aren't that many challenges. Like you know, the tools that we have available, uh, you know, we live uh, in a connected world, so it's easy to communicate. Mm-hmm. Yeah, no, I totally agree. I think uh, as we were starting out, maybe like Skype and Hangouts weren't really up to par, but now late, lately, I've been noticing a much higher quality. Uh, our code, like code review, screen sharing, all that has been a lot better. I've definitely noticed that. Um, so it's only becoming easier to be to be like an offsite outsourced outsourced environment, and it's only becoming better for everyone. So definitely, when you when you're looking at building a team, always look everywhere you can. Uh, I completely agree with that. Another thing I I actually agree with is your like time zone thing. So if you need if you need to be talking to someone every day uh, and on a constant basis, then definitely worry about that a little bit. I had uh, my, one of our first projects was with a client in Russia and I had to wake up, you know, either really early or go to bed really late. And this was like for, I think it was a six month period. Uh, and it was a very like stressful, uh, you know, like I would have to be up at, you know, 1 a.m. and I would have to have a very stressful meeting every day. So that kind of put oh a God, hamper, yeah. yeah, and I would yeah, put a hamper would... on my entire day before that because I'd be either prepping for the meeting or worrying about the meeting. So definitely keep that in mind. Like it's a lot easier to have like, you know, that stressful meeting because sometimes you're going to have to have those meetings where you're going to have to be, you know, the one talking and the one uh, leading it where uh, just keep those in, in your regular hours and don't make it so off hours and that's going to ruin your day uh, regardless of what you're doing. Like you can be doing something fun and you'll be having it in the back of your mind. So Definitely good point there, Azar. Um, yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. You know, again, it sounds it's just that we're we're all aligned, and that's just what makes this uh, you know a lot this relationship work a lot uh, uh, you know as as great as it does. Yeah, for sure. So I I do have a question for you. You, know, you mentioned that when we we're starting off, we were using Hangouts, a combination of Hangouts and Skype, and uh, you know more and more now, you know, we have kind of standardized on Skype because it it just works for us. Mm-hmm. Uh, what else is out there? Are you guys like looking at other like collaboration tools? I haven't like fired up Hangouts in a while. I wonder if like you know that's even a viable solution now. It's not. It's not. Hangouts. Hangouts has been fully or pretty much fully abandoned by Google. Yeah. Um, so really, like computer wise, there's plenty of tools on the phone I found, but computer wise, where you can share your screen, where you can do these things, like. Um, Skype is really probably the best one. There are some business oriented ones. I know like Skype yeah. for business is a completely separate application. It's pretty robust, so that might be worth something to look at. And then there's also technically an actual application called Hangouts uh, for business. It's a business version of Hangouts as well, which is also a completely separate application that is being uh, worked on. So, mm-hmm. so those kinds of things that like if, if I were to think about going to a different uh, application, I'd probably start there. But really, uh, collaboration tools, um, Slack, but again, Slack doesn't have that screen sharing capability as far as I know. I know, Matt, right. you, you use it more than I do. Uh, does it have screen sharing? Uh, that I don't know. I've never actually used it for that. We more or less just use it for uh, a chat for like kind of like content management. So, exactly. But I know that nobody has really even used it in the in like the organization or whatever Slack calls them. So I don't know. I'm not, I'm not sure on that one. Yeah, so it's it's kind of like a, I guess a one horse pony at this point. Like I don't think there's really much of a co- much competition to Skype. I think Teams. I think which is Microsoft as Microsoft, well. Microsoft, yeah, Microsoft Teams. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Does that will, will will that have screen sharing? I believe it does. I'm not 100, percent but I know it has like video calling and that type of stuff. Mm-hmm. And yeah, screen sharing is so important. You know, yeah, that's, that's like yeah. uh, if it wasn't, and you know, we should back up and talk about how important that really is because if that wasn't the case, and I think this collaborative, you know, remote uh, development team that we do have would be so much more difficult. You know, mm-hmm. if you imagine like you know, take screenshots and uh, email it back and forth and uh, that's, you know, can you imagine that kind of nightmare? Uh, but just, you know, being able to say, okay, you know, I'm going to click on this and, uh, you know, watch, can you see what I'm seeing? Vice versa. It just, without that, it wouldn't have been possible, I don't think. Yeah, I totally agree. And I, we've even talked about it a couple of times on the, sh- on the show where screen sharing has been a very, very key feature in most of our interactions with clients, right? Like even if, even if a client is local, we find, uh, uh, and, and Matt can attest to this, we've had situations where like we wouldn't have to drive down, right? Like so even if a client's local, that doesn't mean that it's a great situation because you might have to go through traffic to get there. So sometimes you can supplement that with, with the screen share, with a Skype call, 
and get like you know limit limit that time in traffic obviously sometimes you're going to need that face to face and i think it's important to have those face to faces um but it depends on what the situation is what the questions are stuff like that so it's it's great to have that tool and you're definitely right without screen sharing i don't think this would be possible most definitely like just to kind of t touch on that story i think we discussed it briefly in the last episode but like we do have a client that's a probably about maybe 25 to 30 minutes away depending on traffic uh from where i live and you know, he's he is just a fan of having like the face to face stuff but screen sharing uh once he got the hang of it screen sharing kind of changed him over so like we'll still he'll he'll like save some stuff it'll be like this is too complex like i don't know how to do this so i'll save you know 10 of these complex items then we'll have a meeting once every two months you know drive down and we'll have a discussion but he'll constantly be messaging me and stuff like that and we'll be screen sharing and he's amazed because some of the stuff i'll just do live while he's talking to me because we, we're using right. a, a specific editor. So he's literally like, this is faster. Because normally it's like, I drive there, we meet, he tells me what to do, I leave, you know, a couple days go by, whatever, it's done, I give it to him, it needs to be revised, he has to call me. It's like a whole step where I'm right there, he can be like, no, 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 more, you know, darker purple on that text, or let's make it, let's make it more red, or like whatever, and I could do it live right there. So it, it, it converted him for most things. Excellent, that's a great story. Yeah. It's a really good one. So yeah, that definitely saves time. So um, yeah, like you actually, another question that I wanted to know is what are some other challenges? Like uh, I know before we started talking, uh, before we started recording this, we, you were talking about how you had like, you know, that massive traffic jam uh, going and going into work. And so I, I kind of want to know what, <laughs> what that story was. What, what are the other challenges of being a CTO and be, being a CTO is? Uh, well, you know, that's kind of a, uh, you know, more of a philosophical question. Yeah. Uh, you know, you asked about the, the traffic jam. I mean, that, that really has nothing to do with being a CTO or not. That's true. I mean, to, just, just to talk about, you know, a little bit about that, I think, you know, that's more speaks to the conversation of, uh, having a remote team. Um, you know, that's the kind of stuff that you benefit from, like, you know, when you don't have, uh, you know, four people not showing up to a meeting or in the, you know, in the morning getting ready for your Santa because they're stuck in traffic. Um, you know, uh, yeah. the overall cost, right? Like, you know, of, uh, and I know companies that are exclusively a hundred percent, uh, uh, all in the cloud, like, you know, completely remote workforce and they just hire, uh, you know, conference room meeting rooms when, you know, a couple of times a year when they all get together and, and think about like, you know, how much, overall you know overhead you're saving from like not having to pay a rent i mean i think we're a little ways away from that where all companies can embrace that and like run with that because there's other parts of the organization that we definitely need to have people uh come in uh, you know especially if you're you know if you're manufacturing or you've got an assembly line going um but uh you know there are i think we're as we get into more of a cloud-based world and SaaS pure SaaS businesses i don't see you know any downside to, to that really as long as your team is committed and uh, engaged and, uh, you know, are like-minded and work well with everyone, uh, there isn't really a, a you know, downside that I can think of. Yeah, that's awesome. The future of no offices is going to happen. future of no offices. You know, there's a company locally here called, I believe, uh, TaxJar, and they, from the ground up, they went 100% office-less, and wow. they're doing great. Okay. Yeah. Uh, you know, in our industry, there's a couple of uh, businesses that I can think of, uh, you know, that that are that have embraced that approach also, and uh, yeah, they're making it happen. And uh, I think we're, you know, obviously we're going to see more and more of this, mm -hmm. as especially as uh, the network becomes m even more ubiquitous and uh, uh, the tools are out there, uh, and you know, they're always maturing, as we say, you know, we're moving at the speed faster than the speed of light. So I think this is definitely the future. Yeah, it's the way to go. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. And actually, based on that moving faster than the speed of light uh, and not using maybe all of the new technologies that are out there, here's another question for you. So our current development process has us using a very basic jQuery bootstrap JS HTML stack. And uh, I know that there's a story behind that. So I'm wondering why why would we choose that over something maybe like a more robust framework like Angular or React? And we kind of touched on it already, but I'll let you take it over. Yeah, well, yeah, I'm glad you brought that up. So, you know, as uh, when we were first uh, talking with you, uh, we, we, I mentioned that, you know, we were using, looking at Chrome OS to deploy on and, uh, uh, you, know, uh, you know, backing up from that, we have to, you know, think of a technology stack to develop on. 
So the first app, you know, prototype that I built, uh, our player app, our consumer facing app that runs on these deployed Android tablets um, was, uh, you know, with Angular because that was like, you know, all the rage at the time. And I mean, are people still deploying Angular apps? I don't know. For sure. Uh, Angular is one of the higher used ones. Yeah. I think like React is like, you know, the, the one that I hear most about now. But mm -hmm. anyways, uh, you know, we started building uh, an Angular based app, you know, started uh, going away from jQuery because, you know, I was as I was reading and talking to uh, Angular developers, it was definitely this camp. Like, you know, if you're an Angular camp, you can't have any jQuery in your code base. And, mm -hmm. uh, uh, you know, there was like, you know, people get like all, all aggro about the technology choices that they make. So uh, the nature of our app is also that, you know, like a typical web app or, uh, you know, mobile app that a person writes, either a native or a web app, uh, web application or a native application is, you know, you'll fire it up, use it for, you know, anywhere from like five minutes to, you know, maybe an hour, maybe a couple hours if you're on a website on your computer and then you shut it down and, uh, you know, everything, uh, you know, and then you just fire it back up again. So the idea being that the sessions themselves are not very long. Our application is more of a general purpose kiosk app and it's got to run 24 seven for extended periods of time for, you know, like weeks, days, months, you know, years, uh, with, you know, some, uh, programmatic maintenance and reboots. And so what I learned from uh, you know, our experience with like building something using a framework like Angular was there was a lot of abstraction and there was a lot of encapsulation of the code, which, uh, which is great when you're run, writing an app because it allows you to develop fast and uh, deploy quick solutions. But when you're really like, you know, tuning this app to run 24 seven for extended periods of time and, you know, doing a lot of multimedia uh, 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 deployment, uh, you know, we show a lot of videos on our uh, front front uh, customer facing app. There's inherent, uh, you know, memory leaks in these virtual machines that, you know, that you don't catch maybe over a five minute session or, you know, a few hours worth of a session, but you will if you're running it 24 seven. And so, you know, we started stripping away the frameworks and at the end, you know, we just realized, well, you know, a lot of the stuff that we can do, and this was, you know, in con consultation with you guys, mm -hmm. uh, a lot of the stuff we could do just with a very felt HTML, uh, scaffolding and using jQuery, which I realized, you know, jQuery also is abstracted and there's encapsulation, but it's uh, pretty mature. Um, and, uh, you know, just, uh, you know, bootstrap again, it's very lightweight. So the, the design principle was to keep it very lightweight. And of course, the other part of it was that we wanted to have a code base that could run on multiple systems. Coming back to my original uh, you know, point that I made earlier was, uh, you know, I spent a lot of time focusing on J2ME, became a master of J2ME, then it kind of went, you know, kind of vaporized overnight. And so that was a lesson that I learned back then that I applied here was that, you know, we weren't going to uh, focus in on just one operating system or one uh, deployment environment. So now we're actually thankful, you know, the code base that we built that you guys originally wrapped around uh, with the Chrome uh, uh, app uh, layer that we can deploy on a Chrome base. We took that same app and uh, can deploy it on a variety of Android devices, you know, as long as it's Android 5.1 plus, uh, and uh, even iOS. So, you know, I think we made the right technology choices in keeping the core of the app really lightweight, but right in a way where we could deploy it into multiple target environments. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I totally agree. Like that, uh, the, the key thing there, I think, is that being able to deploy on all the different devices and we're, we're talking about actually building a you know a web app into a one of the, like an apk file for android or a uh, ios app file uh, for ios so not just you know deploying it on a chrome browser actually building it as a native application and being able to like you know talk to the hardware as well yeah. so we can we can do stuff like use the hardware camera we can do stuff like use uh you know, lock the lock the device down into kiosk mode, which is very key for us. Uh, stuff like that. So, accelerometer, stuff like right? Stuff like that. So, yeah, yeah, accelerometer stuff. Like we can we can really like go right down to the hardware level with with being able to still use JavaScript. So uh, and and web view stuff. So that that was really key for us, and it was a huge. Uh, it's still a huge challenge, I think, with uh, being able to you know put a device out there that runs for twenty four hours. Like we've had. Many conversations was like, like, why are these videos like? Sometimes these videos will just memory leak, and uh, then we think like, how does like Netflix or anyone else do it? But really, uh, if you think about it, try to run Netflix for 24 hours on a system. Like you'll probably have it, you know, close every once in a while because 
a android um we were talking about this a little bit before uh how you were like you know how java applets were the next big thing a- android still runs on java that's you know there's an inherent legacy to that and an inherent there's an inherent problems with that's that. right so you have to kind of design around around it Yep, exactly. And uh, that was, you know, again, like, uh, you know, we kind of went into this naively thinking, ah, you know, we'll write a little, uh, uh, you know, web app that'll just, you know, load an asset, show it, we'll load the next asset and, you know, <laughs> kind of r- lather, rinse, repeat, and then quickly realize, well, hey, 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 this isn't, uh, you know, it's not as trivial as you think, you know, especially when you're in this uh, public uh, facing environment, you know, it's, it is somewhat harsh conditions, people are interacting with these devices. So there's this, you know, the whole like, you know, keeping the application running and then also making sure the devices run and they're up and and monitorable and manageable remotely. Yeah, it was uh, definitely a lot more hands on than we uh, than we anticipated. That's for sure. Um, So let's let's move on. Uh, I think unless Matt, do you have any other uh, questions that you would want to talk about during like about our connection with the czar? Well, the one thing uh, the one thing I think that I, I thought of. Uh, was during the time you guys were discussing the the small team, the small team and sort of like moving moving quickly and moving rapidly, is that when you because because I've also worked in very large teams before and very large like sort of departments where there's multiple teams and the the teams are remote, uh, whether it be you know in you know a couple of offices that the company holds or some people are at home or you know they're on a work trip so they're in a hotel room whatever so they're all over the place and it one thing I wanted to kind of note was that it also adds it also adds like an administrative an administrative time. So it's like it's like yeah, like you guys were discussing how it it you know, you know, your guys are constantly in meetings and you guys are constantly in this, but like if you grow even even out there, it's like you need a team to manage the meetings, like the meeting times, the scheduling. You need like a team of project managers to manage the project, to ensure the meetings happen so that the people can have meetings. So it's like it's just it like really blows out of the water. So, you know, instead of have like you're 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 skipping so many steps when you when you're talking about the biggest of the big down to like the really slim small teams so it's just, yeah. it's just one, one thing i wanted to you know kind of mention is that because we we've definitely had that where we've tried to had a project or a uh an entire not a team meeting but like a department meeting and it's like well this guy's in london that guy's over here this guy's in waterloo this guy's in mississauga that guy's on his laptop this guy commutes and shows up later this guy's on nights so it's like okay now uh how do we do this <laughs> yeah <laughs> so like it and it was like it's just pandemonium so yeah it's just something that we de- like you definitely avoid with a smaller team smaller team for sure i think you know the general rule of thumb is uh you know if you can feed a, a team with like two large pizzas uh that's the limit you know anytime you're like going for that third pizza you kind of look around and say Man, is this is this team too big do i need to flatten it or do i need to organize this a little differently <laughs> This is too much pizza. Two, like, the, this is ridiculous. The two pizza okay, rule. I yeah. ordering three pizzas <laughs> from a meeting. This is ridiculous. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I like I like that rule. The two pizza I'll keep, rule. I'll keep that yeah. in mind in the future. If I, have, if I have more than two pizzas worth of people, uh, yeah, some of you are being cut. I'm sorry. Yeah. <laughs> and, and, then, and then of course the you know the additional benefit of the remote team is you don't have to buy the pizza. That's true. Yeah, I've go. never gotten a pizza from you. How's this? God. Yeah, I've not gotten a pizza from you. That's yeah. Right. yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's a good call. <laughs> Uh, yeah, so let's uh, let's move on to your time running a company. So segment four. So first question right off the bat: What are some additional responsibilities that you were not expecting when transitioning to being a CTO slash founder? You know, it's something that uh, as you know, we're starting the company. Uh, you know, CTO the title is just kind of a title, right? Like you know, you, you kind of it kind of tells you, okay, I'm going to be focusing more on the technology side because that's my that's, you know, my background and my partner is going to be focusing on, uh, you know, the, the sales side and the marketing side and the, and the product side. Uh, so, you know, I wasn't, you know, naive enough to think that it's going to be just, you know, okay, I'm just going to be a you know, technical guy and sit there and write code and then build a team and manage them and only be technical. Um, you know, it's, uh, uh, it's the role of a CTO, you know, if you look at the classic definition is what it's, uh, uh, taking company capital and transforming it into a uh, you know products and services and human capital that ladder to your overall corporate strategy hmm. and um, uh, you know I mean that's kind of like you know if you're looking at like the enterprise level C- CTOs as a CTO of a startup I mean you're pretty much and especially as a founder of a startup you know you wear every hat you're the CTO you're a CIO uh, you're the help desk 
uh, you know, by, you know, this, this, my, this web page isn't loading. Okay. Reboot your computer, you know, that kind of stuff. Mm-hmm. It, it, uh, you end up doing a, oh, yeah. a lot of that. So I can't, you know, say that there was anything like unexpected. I had kind of, uh, you know, anticipated that there'll be a, a lot of this going on. Uh, yeah. Okay. Fair enough. Yeah. Like, I mean, you, you do wear many hats and, uh, I know we, when we started, uh, when we started out, you were like much more hands-on than you are now with the coding and development. Uh, what do you miss most about just being, you know, just that, you know, contract coder? You don't have to focus on any of the business side stuff. You don't have to focus on people management, stuff like that. Oh, man. Yeah. Oh, that was uh, <laughs> the, the good old days you're talking about yeah. <laughs> when you can just be a contract coder. Uh, well, you know what I, what I miss about that is, uh, you know, especially as a contractor, you get to do a lot of different projects. Mm-hmm. So it's not like, you know, you, you really get bored with anything. Like, so a typical project may go from like, you know, anywhere from a few weeks to a few months. And then, you know, you wrap that up and then you move on to, to a different project and then, you know, maybe come back and work on that a little bit more. And uh, what that does is kind of forces you to like stay on top of uh, technology, you know, what's out there, what's what's new. Uh, you're definitely more into the, you know, kind of a, a discovery mode at that point and you keep your technical skills sharp. Um you know, going, transitioning into the CTO, like, you know, I mean, this is years ago when I, you know, made the uh, transition from being an independent contributor developer in a large organization to a line manager. Uh, you know, one of the toughest challenges I had there was to be able to let go. And, uh, you know, a lot of times I could say, well, you know, shit, I could just code that faster than, you know, me trying to explain this to this team. But, you know, you, that's not scalable and that's not sustainable either. So, uh just to know that you are in a different role and, you know, your role there is to, uh, you know, line up with the, you know, strategic thinking of the company and then uh, bring your technical staff on that journey and, you know, get them aligned and, uh, you know, build the right staff that can actually deliver the products that, uh, products and services that uh, ladder to that strategy. So there's a, there's a huge part of it is strategic thinking. Yeah, that's pretty big. Uh, I mean, that, that, really interesting point that you made uh with with that for sure i think i think it's a it's a good lesson for people to learn when they're transitioning or or if they're ever going to transition or if they ever even want to transition because you know some people really like the coding aspect and you're saying you know like you gotta think higher than just the code like you you can't just build it yourself even though you think you can do it faster than everyone maybe you can but as soon as you have more features more more, more like your your code base grows you can't do everything yourself so you have to you have to be able to pass that on to someone else and you have to be able to do it in like a very, you know, straightforward and very, uh, a, a very good manner. Like you have to, you have to know how to pass on and delegate. And I, I think you do a yeah, pretty good, yeah. yeah, you do a really good job of that. And that's definitely helped me transition into the role of being more of the, uh, the developer on the projects. That's for yeah, sure. for sure. Uh, and so, you know, w- one thing that you uh, mentioned that I want to call out is like, you know, a lot of people think that, okay, the natural progression is, you know, you start as a junior developer, you know, make your way up to a senior developer, then, you know, architect, and then, uh, uh, you know, manager, then you go up the ladder and become a CTO. Um, and you, at some point, you know, you have to think about this, you know, that's, it sounds like, you know, there's a lot of glamour in there. But if you are a, a hotshot developer and an architect, you know, staying at an independent contributor level, there's nothing wrong with that. You know, you can have a very lucrative career and, you know, very satisfying career. Uh, so, you know, as you're thinking about, like, you know, do I want to get into management? Because there is, you know, there's a, there is, as gratifying and, uh, you know, as, uh, uh, you know, great it can be to be you know, the leader of a team. There is a lot of overhead and a lot of BS that comes with it as well. You know, so, uh, you know, for people that are thinking about that, do I make that move? Uh, it's definitely something to consider. It's not, you know, just all glamour. It's not something that you have to do in a uh, as part of your career mm-hmm. yeah exactly and it's not something like oh i'm a great coder i'm going to be a great manager it's not that straightforward exactly that. yeah, yeah. It's a complete, completely different skill set and uh on, on that is as cto how important were those technical skills so how did they help with with being able to run the company and be able to manage it and stuff like that Oh, I couldn't do it without that. I mean, mm-hmm. if I had, uh, you know, like, uh, if I didn't have that, uh, you know, the technical base and the years of, uh, you know, individual contributor uh, uh, responsibilities and being able to work with other developers, uh, there's no way. I mean, I, is there even such a thing, a non, non-technical non CTO? I don't know. It's, I don't know. I, 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 I feel don't like know. there <laughs> probably is. In Silicon Valley, I feel like for sure. There might be. There might be. Yeah, I, yeah, like I, I, those people probably have their work cut out for them and it's probably... 
you know, quite challenging to, you know, be able to, because you need to be at the end of the day, talk to the people, right? You got to be able to talk to the developers and know, you know, what the, the struggle is. You can't, you know, I, I've worked in companies before where, you know, the program manager comes out and says, okay, you know, uh, I need to, I need to give me estimates on all these tasks over here and tell me, you know, how long is this bug going to take to solve? And uh, as a developer, I know like, you know, hey, this bug, that's the unknown. The reason it's a bug is because it's unknown. And it could take five minutes, it could take, uh, you know, five hours, it could take five days. And, you know, until we do like some more diligence and t some testing around it, uh, you, you know, we won't really know that. So those are the kind of like, you know, real ha world hands-on insight that I think uh, would, you know, serve a CTO well to be able to go rise through the ranks that way. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and I know I noticed you mentioned that the developer-to-developer -developer communications. Uh, I know... That's a super important thing for not just any CTO or just anything, but it's important for if you're going to be working in a team or if you're going to be a good developer in general. Uh, I had one person in college where he was a great developer. And like, honestly, if, if I gave him anything to do, he'd do it and he'd do it great. Uh, but the problem is, is that I would give him something to do and I wouldn't hear from him for like four days. And I wouldn't be able to A, help him. I wouldn't be able to integrate my work with his. Uh, I couldn't really build off of what he's done. I had to just wait and I could, you know, I could contact him every day, but he wouldn't respond until like, I think it was pretty much like he wouldn't respond until he was done the task he was assigned, which was kind of a little bit infuriating to me because obviously there's many, many points during that task that could have been shifted uh, that while he was doing it. So now he has to go back and redo something. So um, not to call that guy out. Hopefully he, he doesn't recognize who he is, but, uh, yeah, that was definitely a more frustrating experience and I definitely don't want to have to deal with that. Yeah. You know, I think we've all been through that also where you have like, you know, the, and that's the thing, just because you're a hotshot, uh, problem solver does not necessarily mean you're a great team member. And, uh, you know, especially like, you know, when we were talking about earlier, the importance of, especially in a remote uh, team, the importance of communication, you know, if, um, uh, if you don't, if, if you know, if you have that one person that's not communicating openly, um, that's a hindrance to the entire team. It, it blocks everyone. Yeah. So you know, it's a, uh, you know, it's it's a it's, and each team is unique. The personalities and teams are going to be unique because their team is basically, you know, what is it? It's a collection of individuals, really. So uh, that's all has to be factored in when you're building a team. Mm -hmm. Actually, I have a side question to ask. Uh, we, last week, we had an episode about communication and how important it is. And like, as we're talking about right now, how important it is to like establish that communicating relationship. Uh, what's the what would you say is a, an acceptable amount of communication? So I was I was a big proponent of you want to have a clear cutoff. Um, you know, if you if you have a family, if you have a life outside of work and stuff like that, if you're, you know, from nine to six or nine to seven and then you don't do any work after that or you don't take any calls barring an emergency obviously are you a proponent of that or are you a more flexible kind of like if i'm if i'm like you know i'll work whenever during the day and i, I don't really have a set time period you know there's it, it really varies from like you know where you are in the uh you know product release or where you are with your company and the, and the team itself i mean the before i started content link i you know was running a consulting business and uh, I was on like, you know, 24-7, 365 days a year. I mean, I remember like sitting on a on a dive boat in, in Cancun and fixing a bug using, uh, you know, the captain of the boat's like phone to get to, get on the network. Uh, that was, uh, you know, to my, you know, wife's dismay, uh, that kind of stuff. Uh, but, uh, you know, I mean, obviously work-life balance is important. But, you know, if you're in the middle of a release cycle and uh, things need to get done, uh, you know, I don't think that there's any issues with like, you know, people like, you know, working, uh, in, late in the evening or through, uh, you know, the weekend at times, but I don't, uh, like it, you know, if that becomes the norm, I, I would try to avoid that at all costs to mm -hmm. make that the, 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 you know, the norm where you're expected to come in and work on weekends or you're expected to be, uh, you know, at your desk at, and field emails at 9, 9 PM. Uh, you know, really just comes down to where you are on a release cycle. You know, I've, I've asked you to, uh, be make yourself available in the evenings as we're doing a, a you know deployment or you know we're doing some kind of test and uh, you know the requests like those are you know very infrequent but they're necessary when they have have to happen. Yeah, and I want to I want to mention that like exactly. Uh, I've we've definitely had work outside of uh, work hours. We usually plan it ahead, but sometimes we don't even plan it ahead, and something comes up, you'll bounce something off me, especially when it's something um, you know random feature that you think of during during the day and you'll just pass it off <laughs> pass it off to me like that that happens all the time and i have no yeah. problem especially don't take if a I'm look sitting, at this yeah if i'm sitting at my computer 
Uh, I have no problem answering, you know, and thinking about stuff like that, uh, if depending on the mindset. Uh, so again, it's not like a clear set rule. There's never a clear set rule with these kind of communications uh, topics. But like you said, don't make it the norm. Don't make it so that uh, you're constantly being bothered at 2 p.m. on a Saturday because that's how you exactly. kind of set yourself up. Like if, if you answer an email or an answer a call at 2 p.m. on a Saturday every time, that client is going to call you at 2 p.m. on a Saturday. That's just how it's going to work. I'm yeah, going to work. they're working. Yeah, yeah exactly. I'm, I'm, well, so, I mean, I will say one thing, though, you know, when especially when it comes to, I mean, a, a business is nothing without its customers and its people, obviously, and uh, customer service is paramount. So, you know, if I get a call in from a customer on a 2 p.m. on Saturday, I'm going to pick that up. I'm going to respond mm-hmm. to that. I mean, the, just yesterday morning, you know, I woke up, grabbed my phone, which is, you know, a practice I'm trying to avoid doing more and more. Yeah. Uh, but the, right away, you know, it was a question from a uh, client and, uh, you know, I responded to them right away, you know, collected my thoughts right away. And they actually wrote back and they were like, you know, pleasantly surprised. They are like, you know, thanks for responding so quickly on a Sunday. Uh, but, uh, uh, you know, the, the whole thing of like having, expecting people to work for you on a Saturday or Sunday is, uh, every week is, you know, that's kind of not cool. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, exactly. So yeah, let's, uh, let's move on to the next question I think here. So, um, and this is the last one in, in all of our segments actually. So that last question is our, how did you learn the business side of your role as CTO and what is the most challenging part of the business side for you? Oh man, I'm still learning it. Uh, yeah, of course. Yeah, of course. you know, <laughs> again, uh, you know, I came up through the developer ranks and, uh, uh, you know, I had some management ex- people management experience uh, behind me. But, you know, like I said, it's uh, not just the CTO. And typically uh, for uh, in a startup environment where we are, the CTO will typically also be a uh, one of the founders. So and, uh, you know, the industry that we serve, the optical retail industry, I'm new to that. Before I started Content Link, I had no experience in that. I'm very thankful that my partner, my business partner and our CEO, uh, you know, is an industry veteran and he was able to guide us and, you know, like, you know, help us navigate through the, uh, you know, the, the, the waters here, so to speak. Uh, but, uh, you know, as we are right now, like my early focus when we were starting out for the first year and a half, two years was uh, definitely technology, you know, t- t- uh, development uh, stacks, development teams, you know, working with people like you, yourself, um, you know, think of anticipating what the needs could be, uh, you know, hardware, software, all that. Uh, but now where we are, you know, we've got a, a mature platform, you know, we are basically uh, now we're just, you know, doing feature development and new innovations. So the technology I'm feeling pretty good about, you know, we put a good team and system in place like yourself. So I can I, I know I'm confident in that, uh, you know, if I assign something to you, it's either going to get done or you'll communicate out what the challenges are and then we'll work together in resolving it. So that what that does is frees up my time to think about, you know, the other part of our strategy is uh, uh well, I mean, our strategies, our strategy, how to uh, uh, you know enable that, and so a lot of it is operations these days, right? It's uh, you know now that we've got a healthy client base out there, we want to make sure that they're happy. So uh, customer support is a big part of uh, you know what I do. Um, uh, running the ECP, the independent uh, uh, OD uh, sales uh, channel, I spend a lot of time on that, mm-hmm. and uh, you know everything kind of comes back to technology because we are a SaaS business at the end of the day. Uh, but it's an evolving process. And a lot of times I actually think like, you know, there's a textbook definition of CTO, but what exactly is a CTO do? And if you go online and look for that, it really varies from, you know, company to company, CTO to CTO, and, uh, you know, just where you are in the, in, in the phase of the business. You know, the, I, and, you know, we're kind of like just, you know, having an open co- riffing here. Uh, my feeling is, you know, I think I do a pretty good job as a CTO of an early stage startup. I honestly don't see myself as a CTO of a you know large scale enterprise. I think that's a very different role for a very different skill set. Um, and uh, you know, someday I hope you know the content link grows to that point. I hope that I've hired a different CTO to take over that role at that point. And I do something else at that uh, when we get there. Yeah, that's uh, that's definitely a key thing to know your limitations, right? Like a lot of, a lot of people will go in and bite off more than they can chew, or not even more than they can chew, but more than they want. Right. Or their interest, right? Yeah, their interest, at that point, exactly. their interest is very different. Yeah. yeah. And then they get ground down into the system. So, yeah, it's, it's cool that you already know kind of your where you want to stop. Uh, it'd be interesting to see when it does get to that to that size, if you'll be able to let it go. But <laughs> I'm, Well, you'll you'll be there for the journey. So we'll, we can yeah. probably have another chat back then, you know, when, when that happens and kind of, you know, 
refer back to this conversation. Yeah, I'm, I'm really interested in that. Uh, yeah, so that kind of wraps up our uh, all of our segments. There's one more segment after this, which is called Web News. I'm just wondering, uh, time frame wise, Azar, we don't want to keep you for too long. Uh, are you okay with going on to the web news? It's kind of more of a back and forth. Um, we just kind of introduce the topics and we talk about our opinions on it. Uh, it, it. It's up to you. So we'll we'll let you decide on that one. You know, I've got like another uh, 10, 15 minutes there, Fee, and I can, I'm can. i happy to sit in on part of that conversation. And I'll uh, excuse myself when, uh, when I got to run. Sure, that that sounds good. So I'll, I'll pass it off to Matt. Uh, awesome. if you If you have any questions or, or stuff you want to add. Uh, I also want to make sure that Azar has time to do his self plugs and you know give give us a you know a, a good goodbye. So whenever you're ready to leave, Azar, just let us know and we'll kind of like uh, pass it off to you and we'll continue on the conversation after that. Yep, sounds yep. good. Okay. Alrighty, so let's uh, let's jump into web news then, just for in the interest of time. So uh, the web news for this week is uh, incomplete ecosystems. So generally, what do I mean by ecosystem? Uh, it's obviously a collection of software, uh, typically from the same manufacturer that all complement each other. Uh, a primary example would be your iCloud storing all your contacts and other data from your iPhone, so you can use it on your Mac, or maybe you're syncing it to a new phone if you buy a new iPhone, uh, that type of thing. Uh, ecosystems have become a key part of people's workflow over the past few years because everything's connected. So obviously you don't want to keep entering those same contacts uh, into your different phones as you upgrade. Um, they're often a key feature that people look at when they actually are purchasing a device. So sometimes somebody, you know, maybe bought one of the original iPhones and is, you know, maybe he wants it. They like they want to try an Android phone, but they're locked into that ecosystem. So it's something that really drives, like, you know, it's like the purchasing power they want. They want to stay with where all their data is at. Um, so there's tons of different ecosystems out there. There's ones for productivity. There's ones for smart homes. There's one for, you know, ones that are only on this platform, one only on that platform. It's all over the place. And some of them, you know, go across multiple platforms. And we'll be touching on a couple of those. So I have a couple of examples of what I would consider an incomplete ecosystem to bring it back to the web news. So, for example, Samsung, uh, so I have an S8 Plus, and uh, Samsung has software that's primarily, you know, on their phone. So things like notes and Bixby and their email app. And unfortunately there's like, there's no, there's no clients for the PC to use those things. So you can use things that kind of like mirror the phone where you can use like side sync and that type of thing, but there's no like Samsung email client on your phone. There's also no Samsung email service. So it's, you know, you sign in to, you know, your Gmail or your Microsoft account or whatever within the Samsung email app. So there's another hole there. You don't, there's no like Samsung email. Um, so there, that, that's one thing. And then there's Microsoft's of course. So Microsoft is kind of more productivity based. So we all know it, you know, your Microsoft account, primarily email contacts, calendar, among other things. If you're using Windows or you're using Android and specifically the Android app, you can use Cortana, which is their voice assistant. Uh, but they don't really have a focus on home functionality. So they don't really have like a smart speaker out there. So you kind of have to use your PC or your Windows tablet if you have one of those. And then, of course, there's no way to really take this experience on the go with the exception of maybe having like a laptop or a tablet, like maybe a Surface or another third-party tablet because Windows Phone hardware is basically dead and therefore, you know, there's no real mobile experience or no real, you know, super modern mobile experience for Windows with the exception of, you know, some Android apps so they can kind of plug into that other that other ecosystem. So it, it, you, could, you could see it's kind of starting to blend together. So which leads us directly to uh, Android, which Android really doesn't have a full desktop experience. You know, it's kind of starting to kind of get there um, with, you know, the Pixel Book uh, and, uh, the, the, you know, Pixel Book and Chromebooks. So Chromebook is obviously, you know, more, you know, sort of Google uh, oriented stuff. So the older ones, they don't run Android apps, but the newer ones, especially things like the Pixel Book, they run Android apps. So it's kind of like that in between where it's like Chromebook is kind of Google's, you know, you know, desktop or computer software. And then you have the, you know, the complementing Android mobile experience, and you can bring those apps kind of on board to your uh, Pixel Book or your Chromebook if it's, if it's new enough and compatible with it. But unfortunately, you know, Google Assistant, Google Assistant's on your phone, it might be on your Chromebook, but if you're a Windows user, which you probably are because there's holes in the software solution that Chromebooks give you, they they have a Google Home hardware unit, but there's no G Google Assistant on Windows 10 despite there being Chrome. So you can see there's holes here. So it's kind of what I'm going to kind of throw it to the floor now. You know, what 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 effects do you think or like what what holes do you guys find in ecosystems and and what what do you guys what ecosystems do you guys use and like, like what would you like to see from the ecosystems you guys use? 
Yeah, Azar, go ahead. Yeah, Azar, Do you go have, ahead. A have a comment? Yeah, no, you know what? I, I, I'm glad you brought this up. I hadn't really given this much thought. Uh, you know, I like the, you know, what you, what you were describing. Like, you know, it seems like all the ecosystems that we have out there, like, you know, they take you to about 80%. Um, and it's like, you know, the last 20%, the last mile, if you will, they kind of choke on it. And I'm, and I'm just wondering, why is it that it evolves that way? And if you look at, you know, uh, the example of Google, is it because those organizations are so large, both Google and Microsoft, that they've built these like, you know, individual components of the ecosystem in silos and they somewhat connect them, but there's nobody, you know, cobbling together that last 20% of it? Is that is that the phenomena that we're seeing? Is that what leads to these incomplete ecosystems? Yeah, I mean, we've talked about this a lot. We have um, like the, the whole, you know, Google having those silos built up where the teams almost don't communicate with each other. Uh, yeah, yeah, that's uh, that completely. That's probably what's happening. I don't, I don't see any other explanation for it because why? Like there, there is starting to be rumblings of a Google, uh, a new OS from Google that will be a desktop OS uh, right. that will have that integration. But and I think as an OS, it would be a challenger, like because it has all the applications that you would need. It has a better app installing and updating experience than windows does in my opinion because yep. really windows still relies a lot on dot exes and they're insecure uh you can't really auto update them unless they have an auto updater built in they kind of like that you know in, in the background they're pretty bad i i could see android really taking that throne away um I, again we haven't even talked about ios at this point because yeah uh, or mac os I, I i consider them one right so you could say that they might have and I'll put quotations around it's the most complete ecosystem of of the ones that we've mentioned. Uh, I would I would say Samsung definitely does not have a complete o- ecosystem because it relies uh, completely on Android uh, and doesn't have any. Well, again, it has this gimmicky thing where you can put your S8 or S9 on on a dock and it'll turn into like a window like a windowed experience Dex. on a monitor, which yeah, is kind of yeah. Cool. Yeah, it's called Dex, right? Uh, and it's kind of yes. cool, and I could see that being really useful. But it has it also has r- ridiculous limitations on like how many apps you can run in the background and stuff like that. Um, as far as I know, maybe that's been changed since I like first looked at it. They they might have improved it like drastically. Um, I th- I think like a lot of things, uh, and C- Chrome OS is included in this because I'm we're thinking about it on the developer side, right? Like, how would you set up a development environment on an Android device? Is there a like a, you know a VS Code or a code editor? Is there a, a server in the back end that you can run up and have a local server stuff like that? That's how that's how I think about it. Um, really, the only three I know of that can do all of that is uh, Linux, another one that we haven't mentioned, Mac and uh, and Windows, right? That that's yeah. You know, the, the, the Linux is one of those things. It's like the little engine that could. You know, I mean, it, it powers a big part of the web. You know, on the, in the infrastructure side. But, uh, you know, I've been playing around with Linux since, you know, like since pre Red Hat days. Uh, and it's like, you know, every 10 years or so, I'll like try to install Linux on a desktop and try to use that as my primary <laughs> machine. But it's just, you know, the user interface is clunky. It's just, it just never gets there. I'm, you know, I'm always come out disappointed out of that. You know, it does great on a server, but like, you know, it's never really matured into a mobile OS, uh, uh, you know, natively. And uh, there, I mean, so so one thing, as as you were saying that, uh, Matt and Mikhail, one thing I was thinking was, and you, you didn't preface this section by saying, like, in, incomplete ecosystems are good or bad. And I just wanted to get your guys' thoughts on that. I don't necessarily think that it's a bad thing to have an incomplete ecosystem. Like, you know, if you talk about, like, you know, where Apple is pretty close to it, they become that vertical integrator uh, company where everything that you have to do, you have to end up going through Apple and paying them some something. Yeah. To make, uh, you know, to do anything, to release an app or, you know, to even have development tools. What are you guys' thoughts on that? Uh, well, personally, I've been kind of, I've been kind of really getting into the smart home scene. And mm-hmm. one of the things I, and this is like, this is sort of, I'm actually writing a piece about this on for medium is, is one of the problems I'm having is so recently, uh, Google home, the app, uh, got an update so that it has like you know, on-screen quote unquote physical switches. So you can actually like, instead of just with a voice, like with through Google assistant, you can actually press off and on before that yeah. required like a third party app because Google itself doesn't make smart switches. For example, TP link does, and it plugs into Google home. 
That's right. So it's like, it's like, okay, fair enough. So now it's like, okay, I, I still need the TP link app to do the initial setup, but I can now just have my Google home app. But then there's like this hole in the ecosystem where, so for example, we have a, uh, we have a leak, a leak and humidity detector in the hose that like guards the, uh, the hot water heater. And it, like it has like a local alarm, sure, but it's made by Honeywell. Honeywell supports Google Assistant, but not this model of leak detector. So now I have mm-hmm. a Honeywell app installed that I need to have that, and then it emails me, like if it has like a if it has like a problem, which is fine. Like it works, like admittedly, but it'd be super nice to have it all all in one. So I would say personally that I'm I'm really like I'm 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 okay with a part with a like a mix and match, I guess, a mix and match ecosystem when it's something like Microsoft where I just sign in with my email account into whatever email app. And for the most part, it just kind of functions. So like, that's like really seamless. But when some, when it comes to, I guess the really modern IOT stuff where Google is kind of really trying to hold you into their ecosystem, it's like more, I kind of want more things to go into it. And then furthermore, Samsung smart things, for example, has devices that only work with that. But yet Samsung smart things is on Android, but it doesn't support Google home. So on my S eight plus, if I have, and I don't, but if I had a smart things, uh, device, now I have to use smart things, Google home, and possibly a proprietary app to do the setup and then usage. So now it's like, now I'm fragmented on an ecosystem that's fragmented in a, <laughs> in, in a smart home. Like it's, it's, it's kind of a mess. It's ecosystemception. Jeez. It, it is it is ecosystem perception is right you're like three levels deep and and you know i've uh i've got a, a similar challenge you know where I, I, when i started up setting up my uh home automation then you know i've been gradually building it up and so the individual pieces i've got is you know i use a tp link for uh, the switches um and then uh you know this app called casa which is a third-party app which you know it gives me the mobile interface to it yep and then i've got it set up with uh alexa uh, so I can, you know, control with the, you know, voice commands and obviously let Amazon and the rest of the, you know, the intelligence world know exactly when I'm hot and cold <laughs> and when my lights are on or off. So, um, um, it's, I guess, you, you know, and, and again, I'm not sure if that's necessarily a bad thing, not the snooping part of it, but, you know, like being able to put things together. But again, the, you know, as I think, as, we, as I say this out loud, I'm a pretty, you know, tech savvy guy and I can, you know, pretty much cobble something together. I'm thinking if this was, you know, my my mother or my father trying to set it up, there's no way they could do that in a in a fragment system. They would have to have like, you know, hire somebody to set it all up for them. There isn't like, you know, this take a box out, plug everything in, and, and ready to, and you're ready to go. I I would definitely agree with that because one of the things that's wrong with the, the smart home ecosystem is, you know, you might you might say, well, then don't buy a smart things if you want to have Google Home. So it's like, okay, fair enough. So uh, let's say we're happy with the TP link because I, I we probably have the same the same switch. So let's say we're happy with the TP link switch. Well, in this case, it's like, okay, well, I want a leak detector for my hot water heater. Go look it up. No, nope, TP link doesn't make that. There's a hole in the ecosystem yeah. right there. Now it's like, well. Now I got to get this Honeywell one. And then when I looked it up, it's like, oh, this Honeywell one isn't compatible with smart things. It's only compatible with Honeywell. So it's like, okay, mm-hmm. so now, now there's a hole in that, but it's, it's, it's a mess. I, I agree. It's a mess. I, yeah. I agree that it's a mess, but I, 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 like, I, I do agree with Azar's point in, I don't know if I'm okay with there just being one complete ecosystem or something like that, uh, where it, like, let, let's say ideally, right. Apple, um, this isn't ideal for me, but ideally for, I guess, people that want one ecosystem. Uh, Apple just does everything. All the smart all the smart home stuff. So they have your leak detector. They have your switches, right? And really yeah. no other... And then and then what, what happens is no other company has those. But you're all in one ecosystem, all right? But everything, like, with Apple, a leak detector will cost you, you know four or five times the price of what your leak detector costs you now. Are you okay with paying that for and, that? And you have to up, update that every two years. You'll have to buy a new lead, lead detector because, you know, they've obsoleted or deprecated the, or the original hardware. So you can't just go to a different company and buy another bit yeah. and, uh, you know, seamlessly integrate. Or, or, so yeah, that or, is repair, a, or repair it. Or repair it, yeah. Hey, you, yeah, you guys, uh, you know, with that, I do have to jump off here. It's yep. been awesome talking to you guys. Uh, you know, I look forward to hearing the rest of this uh uh, podcast when it does get published yeah thanks for coming on for sure um i'll let you kind of just do uh any self plugs you want and then if you just send me the links i'll put those in the show notes as well 
Yeah, no, I mean, I don't really have anything to self-plug in. I just uh, want to, like, uh, I guess there is one. Uh, well, two I can think of now that, I, that I've had a chance to ramble a little. Uh, you know, contentlink.com, please go visit our website when you get a chance. Uh, it is, uh, you know, exciting uh, uh, platform that we've developed, uh, focusing just on the optical retail space. And, uh, you know, we'd love to get your thoughts. If there are any people in the optical retail space that are listening in, please definitely, uh, you know, check out our website and, uh, you know, reach out to me uh, personally, you know, support at contentlink.com. You can send an email there. And uh, uh, if you've got any other feature ideas or development ideas, uh, you know, I'd love to connect to like-minded people. And the second plug I'd like to give is for uh, uh, Digital Dynasty, Matt and uh, Mike. You know, as we started off the conversation, uh, you know, we mentioned that we've been working together for about uh, three years now, and it's been a smooth uh, journey. These guys are, you know, a crack team, uh, always open for, you know, trying new ideas and move fast, uh, and just, uh, you know, a couple of great guys. So uh, with that, uh, you know, thanks once again for having me on the, on the call here, and uh, I look forward to hearing this when it's all published. Hey, thanks, thanks a lot for stopping yeah. by, and thanks for that. Thanks for that plug there. We really, yeah. uh, really appreciate it, and really like, uh, really like working with you yeah. for sure. Excellent. For sure. I'm blushing. Here's so many years. <laughs> <laughs> All, right. All right, guys, have a good one. All right. See you later. Bye, thanks. Sir. Alrighty. Um, so yeah. I guess we can continue the conversation. Um, the one thing, the one thing I, I, I and I, I, I really want to stress this, and I think this is more like a UX thing, but. What I want is I, I I will say I agree with Azar and what you and your last point there, Mike, where you were saying like maybe not have only one. That's a really good point because I don't want to buy a five hundred dollar smart speaker. Yeah. I want to buy the mini devices because I don't care. Like I don't care about sound quality. If I want to listen to sound, I have a sound system. Um. So and I have like a good pair of headphones on right now. So I'd mm -hmm. rather use that. Um, I want us, I want, like, I have the, I have both. I have a Google home mini and I have a, an Amazon echo dot. So like I have those both. I, one of them's just to put things into my Microsoft calendar. That's the Alexa. And the other one I kind of do everything else on. So there's that, there's that hole in the ecosystem. But anyway, um, but like, those are not, oh, come on Alexa. But anyway, she's talking to me now. I don't know if you ever <laughs> picked that up on the mic, but she's talking to me. Uh, but she always talks to you. She always talks to me. Like I, she's usually muted actually to be honest. Um, but one of the things, one of the things with this, one of the things with this, with this ecosystem is that I bought both of those. Well, I, I received one as a gift, but I bought the second one and it was admittedly a prime day, prime day deal. I think that's what it's called. Anyway, prime sales or those are, but it was like, I think, I think it was something like $50 Canadian for one smart switch and an, and a, an, an echo dot. And I was like, okay, well, you know, that's that's reasonable because I, I I was curious about Alexa and I wanted a smart switch and the smart switch was thirty or forty bucks, so it's like, eh, what are, what the heck, right? So might as well have both at that point. Um, but I want I want and to, to go back to that UX point, I want somebody to make an ecosystem where I want you to to let's say you're you're out at work and you drive home. So let like I don't want to get into the whole car thing because that's a whole other thing, but you drive home. When I, when I enter my home, I want to enter, and this is like really corporate sounding, I want to enter a manufacturer environment. <laughs> so I want to go like, I want to go like, uh, I'm not going to say the keyword, but I'm going to say like, Google, I want you to open my garage door, turn on the coffee, try and turn on the lights. And mm -hmm. I want the lights to turn on, I want the coffee maker, and a lot of this stuff you can do, I don't know about the garage door opener and all this, but you I want all of, you, you could probably do that. Google is actually probably the second most complete because I was going to say email and all that's on there, but then I go to my computer, turn it on, and what do I got? I got Windows. So now it's like, well, Google can plug into Windows rather easily, right? You know, obviously, like there's the, the holes in ecosystems can be plugged by other manufacturers, but I, I, I would really love to be under one roof, and I think that might be because of when I used to use a BlackBerry, it was just sort of like... Everything was everything was closer together, whereas Android I think gives me too much choice. If that's I don't know if that's crazy, um, but like people are like you can use the because I have the I have a key two right now, that's my active phone and and like I can use like and I I can use and do use the hub for email which has my Microsoft accounts plugged into it, but I could also use Outlook and then Outlook doesn't you know as as seamlessly in my opinion um, and it is a matter of opinion as as seamlessly integrate with android as well as i'd like 
So now it's like, well, do I go with Microsoft because then I'm fully kind of as close to their ecosystem as possible because my my emails are Microsoft accounts, or do I use or do I use the hub as this other thing? And for other people, and I think you would probably agree with this, Mike, and interrupt at any time because I'm just you know going off here, but like to me, I don't want the I don't want that choice. I don't know why. I think that I think that might sound weird. And and the instant the choice is taken away from me, I would probably want the choice back, as indecisive as it is. But I I I think I want to experience for once, like maybe to try it. I want to be brought into an ecosystem in which it is complete, and then just that's it. Like it's like okay, well, I want to try this for a year or a month or whatever. It's interesting, but but then you also hate macOS. Notice, no, like, if you want to try it, my suggestion is turn off your computer. Oh, God. Here we go. Throw out your phones. <laughs> and Come on just now. Go, go into a Mac store and engulf yourself. But, but that's the closest thing we have, right? Like, you can you can engulf yourself in that Mac OS ecosystem, and you can experience it firsthand what it's like to have a limited choice because, Mac like, as, as much choice as it gives you, it's still limited compared to everything else. Like, I know the, the App Store and stuff has a ton of different things and all that, but really, they do a very good job at trying to keep you in their environment, like, use their mail client, use their... Uh, use their keyboard, use, you know, use all their hardware. They do, they do the best job out of anyone. And right, I, right. I've had many conversations. I'm sure you've had many conversations with people that use the Mac, use Macs, use iOS and use everything together. How hard it is for them to switch to anything that, that shows that they're doing a good job, not by just being like, you know, we're not saying they're brainwashing people, but they're actually providing services that people are using and are enjoying for the most part. The issue I have with that is there's some things that I don't like and there's some things that I just can't change. And I, I personally, for me, I know we're, we're different in this, in this scenario. Uh, I need to have that ability to change it. Even if I don't change it, like, even if I'm like, oh, you know what? I, I could in the future, you know, download a different email client. I like the fact that I can do that. I like the fact that there's even an option for me to do that. Right. Like where if, if I was stuck with one email client, let's say I had like a BlackBerry device. Now there's no email clients for that. And it only has BlackBerry email. As good as BlackBerry email might be, I don't know how good it is because I've never used it. Uh, like, like you mean I, on, you mean BB10, right? Like not I'm like talking BB10. Devices. Yeah, I'm talking yeah. actually like BlackBerry, the BlackBerry OS, or even an older BlackBerry OS, whatever. Like you can't you can't access any Android applications. Nothing. You literally have to just use you know BlackBerry email client, BlackBerry Messenger, all that. If I had that situation, as good as those applications might be, even if they were immaculately made, I would be constantly like. I don't know, not angry, but constantly have anxiety over the fact that I can never switch. And I'd be looking to go to a different phone or some, or a different computer or something because I'd be I, like, I'd be panicking. And I'd be like, well, what if like I'll, I'll, <laughs> I'll, panic, I'll, yeah. <laughs> well, no, because like I'll all of a sudden see like Gmail releases a new feature that I don't have. And I'll be like, I really like that feature. And now like there's nothing I can do. That, so, that That's a relief to me, actually. <laughs> I'm like an old man where I'm like, well, I don't have to learn that. Yeah. Like, uh, I, like I might look it up. Be like, oh, that's cool. Look at it. Well, I guess this app doesn't have it. Yeah. And then I just move along with my day. Um, yeah. Unless it's something vital, then it's like, okay, I gotta, I gotta like switch apps or something. You know, um, I, I want, I want the users' input on this. I want, or not the users, the the, the listeners. Um, should we challenge Matt, maybe in the future, to a oh, no. Mac OS? He has to use Mac OS for X amount of time, and someone can suggest the amount of time. Uh, should we challenge Matt to just use Mac OS? I feel like we, I feel like he would never leave. One second here. Like now, are we talking about just the OS or the ecosystem? So I would need to, I need to get an iPhone, a Mac, Everything. Everything. an iPhone, a Mac, and then oh, fuck, yeah. a fucking HomePod for $500 almost. Well, no, you can't, if you can't, if you can't afford it, this is the thing. In, <laughs> here we when go. When you're in the go. ecosystem, if you can't afford it, you can't use it. That's it. Or not want to afford it. Like yeah. I could, I, I could go tomorrow and buy a HomePod. I if, will not be doing that. <laughs> well, no, but exactly. But like, if if I'm a Mac person and I can't afford getting their headphones, like their whatever headphones, and my headphones break, I'm not listening to music ever. That's it. Period. Or or just I wouldn't, use the I wouldn't, I wouldn't speaker. even dignify myself to put like other headphones in my ears. That's the way you have to think when you when you do this challenge. That would be an interesting challenge. I'm not going to commit to anything. However, it does, in terms of conversation, raise a very interesting point in that 
I so quickly, when we needed a tablet that ran Windows, ran to Samsung rather than running to Surface. Or there was even like that Acer book, which was more like a, I don't know if it's actually called the Acer book, but it was an Acer tablet of sorts that was more like a traditional laptop. It's not like I have Surface devices. I have a Tab Pro S. I have a Lenovo Y500. I have a custom-built desktop. I have a gateway laptop that's years old from school. You know, I don't have... I don't have these, like, crazy... Or not crazy, but I don't have these integrated, fully integrated devices. So that that's, that, re- that raises a really good point, is what if Google was the one that had the HomePod-like thing, where it was all about really great sound... But there was no like, you know, quote unquote HomePod mini where Google kind of, you know, you could buy the Google Home or you could buy the Google Home mini and it saves, you know, it saves you some money, but you sacrifice sound quality. But in my case, it's like, well, my use case doesn't call for this. But Apple, in, in terms of the Apple ecosystem, it's like, you know, I'm not going to start suddenly listening to music on my on my HomePod, but I bought that device and now it has a fixed capability. It is a fixed capability in which it, it is a good speaker. And therefore, part of the value that I'm paying for is listening to music. Because um, like the Google Home Mini, I listen to podcasts on it all the time. Mm-hmm. And it's perfectly fine for that. But for music, for music, it beats the Echo Dot, in my opinion. And that's the second generation Echo Dot, by the way. Um, but it it beats it beats, it beats beats that one um, by a lot. It doesn't beat the new... I, I, don't, I have never tried the newest Echo Dot. But I'm just wondering, like... Like, like a, a prime example, actually, is the fact that I went to Samsung. I didn't go to Pixel. It's like I wanted Android, but I went to Samsung and I used BlackBerry software. Yeah. Like, you wanted, you wanted to be locked into a, a more Samsung. Like, a, like Samsung is, is notorious for being a locked-in ecosystem kind of thing. Like, on Android, uh, where they, they make all their own applications and stick them down people's throats no matter how hard people say we don't want these applications and they're terrible. And, like, the I mean, to be fair to Samsung, they have improved on all the applications, but when, Sam, like, I had an S4, all of their applications, and I mean every single one that they created for specific purpose, specific purpose like SMS Messenger, uh, email, even their phone client, all of their applications were worse than what other people had made. So I don't know how it is now, but like Samsung just loved to make their own applications and just stick them down people's throats. And you kind of chose that because you wanted a more a more defined ecosystem. Is that yes. fair? Yes, I really, really like a lot of their apps. Yeah, I don't use all of them, but I really like a lot of them. Yeah. Uh, so, their contacts are great. Their email kept adding things to a spam box that wasn't a part of the Microsoft service. Like, you know how, like, obviously Microsoft itself, because I'm using Microsoft email, they have, like, a spam filter service. Mm-hmm. Or, like, I don't know if you call it a service, but it's a spam filter. The email app was putting things into a spam box for me that wasn't a part of the Microsoft one, and it was causing problems, so I had to quit it. But the app worked fine, other than that. Mm-hmm. Uh, their game launcher is unprecedented. I really like their game launcher feature. It's really fantastic. Uh, stuff That's like that. Like their their game launcher is real. Like it is the it is amazing, and they've like reworked it like like visual wise because they know people love it. It records games. It records stuff. You can add other apps in there to quickly record those. You can choose how much power you want that app to have. You can choose like longevity or performance it, like on the fly. It is it it is a or you can, you can mute you can mute the game and it's all games are muted anything that's added to the app launcher is muted you, or to the game launcher is muted you can you can like it is a it is a fully functional really well functioning like not no glitches app like I it is a fantastic feature it's really really good and I don't really play games like all that much but when I do I don't want them to blare my blare the intro sound or blare an ad or or I can set it to mute my notifications. I'm playing something, I don't want to be bothered. And it just does it. It it's it's a really really good feature. Yeah, that's you, what cool. what apps did you use on Samsung out of curiosity for the S4? Like was it just like I've cuz I keyboard, I, started... I I tried the keyboard and it was like I don't know the the wor- one of the worst experiences <laughs> I've ever had typing. I use um, that. I use the I use the Samsung keyboard. <laughs> again, it could have improved by the time. Like this is S four. This is what five years ago. It's it's around five years. 
That's um, fair, yeah. And, so and this it could is have, it could have improved, but I know that it was it was atrocious when it when it first came out. Um, I tried their email client for sure, and I did not enjoy it. I don't know why I didn't like their email client, but there was something about it that I just couldn't I couldn't do something that I needed to, and I just stopped using it. Um, plus they had a bunch of like gimmicky applications. They had their own app store. I don't know. Do they still have their own app store? Yes. The galaxy app store. Yep. Yeah. That was annoying because like, you don't like you, you install something on there. You don't know where it's installed now. Like it's installed only on there. Is it in the play store? What's updating it? Uh, that was annoying. Like I, I don't like if I, if I have a device, I want one application store. Uh, I don't like the fact that Amazon has their own app store. I've actually had some experience with that one because I downloaded it on my one of my phones because I like bought a game or something on the Amazon app store. And I'm like, hey, let's you know try it out. But that, that frustrated me to no end. Um, I'd rather just pay for everything on one store. And that's kind of like leading into your point where like locked down in, in an ecosystem where I'm more of like in the Google ecosystem though. Um, but again, I wouldn't, I wouldn't feel comfortable if I was locked in the Google ecosystem. That's where I think I differentiate. That's a good point because you're you're sort of like you're sort of there for like I would say the root of ecosystems for a lot of people be, uh, is is uh, contact or email contacts calendar, and um, like a Google account has that among all these other things we've discussed Google Home and whatnot. But it's really interesting because it's it. Like you're right. Like you use, I would say that at least as far as I know, you use Google Assistant or sorry, the 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 uh, email contacts calendar quite a lot. But you're not like super into like you don't have the Google Assistants in your house. You don't have the Google Home devices in your house. In your house, you're not your house isn't smart. Like you don't have smart switches just like laying around or like or like you know what I mean? Not laying around, but like in use. Like you don't have you have you even entered that section of the ecosystem, and you could so easily just go to Alexa or something, right? Like you could yeah. You could so, I haven't so started, easily do that. Yeah, exactly. I haven't started any smart home stuff. I'm not going to say I won't, but uh, I I don't see any too much use for it. I like um something I will do uh, maybe in a new house is have smart outlets so I know the power that's coming out of it. So I'll be able to monitor how much power my computer is using, how much power everything's using, and I can kind of optimize my you know power usage. That's something oh, I've been wow. kind of. Yeah, I've been really interested in that, and that's becoming really affordable um, and something that I like. I could definitely take advantage of. Uh, I don't like obviously temperature control is cool. Uh, we have an Ecobee system, so I guess that is part of a smart home system. So we do have that uh, in our okay. house. Uh, that's really cool, being able to you know turn on and off the air conditioner, the heat, and change the temperature and see what if it's on, what the temperature is like. Different sensors in your rooms um, that I find really useful. For sure. So I guess yeah, I have something, but I haven't I haven't had the need to like be able to control that with my voice. So that's why I don't have any uh, you know, Google Home minis or anything like that yet. Uh, that could change. I could I could see a use for it. Um, so far, no though. I will I will say for that, um, and not to take it too far from ecosystems, but for that section of the ecosystem for you to get into it, and this is I mean this is what took me to get into it, so it could be different for you. But one of the things that I did was I just started using it a lot. And without hesitation now, I just ask questions. Like, no one's in the room, and I'll just ask the Google a question or the uh, Amazon a question. Like, like I'll just fire it off. And the, and it, um, I've said, I think I may have written this on, on Medium or something, or I've said it a few times somewhere where uh, I, I, I dictate something as vital when I do it without thinking. And I do that without thinking now. And I've done that in a room without a, a smart speaker before, accidentally. Mm-hmm. I've just said it and been like, oh, what's the hell am I doing? Because I've been like upstairs where there isn't a Google home and I'll be like, you know, Google, what's the weather? I'll be like, oh, what what am I doing? Because my phone's in my pocket and I'm just like talking to nothing. <laughs> but it's like, it's, yeah, like I look like an idiot, but it's it's the fact of like, oh, maybe I should have Google homes everywhere I go. Kind of like I used to have tablets wherever I went. Like I used to, you know, I have tablets all throughout the house. Maybe I need to have the, these all throughout the house now. But like, like I, I'm at that point where they're now vital. Another really, like that thing where you're mentioning with the, the thermostat to bring it back to ecosystems is, I bought a um, an in-room uh, air conditioner years ago used, but I did that based on price because I didn't care to have the smart features. But it's a really good point. What if, what if, and they don't, as far as I know, what if Apple made some sort of air conditioner? And it was only this one's compatible with Siri or whatever. Could you imagine the price that would be? 
and like the seven thousand dollars. It'd be like guess. it'd be it'd be ludicrous, and then maybe it would be an in window one, not an in room, and then it'd be a whole disaster trying to set that up on a window. Like it'd be so like I. I think I'm more leaning toward your and Azar's side where I I think I want a seamless experience I, more than anything actually. Yeah. Which more unfortunately, than, yeah, which unfortunately more than one manufacturer. Yeah, but, will will probably never happen um because of the fact that there are these multi multiple ecosystems that are incomplete. Like I don't think we'll ever have a fully seamless experience like what you want because of the fact that we want different things it's 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 an interesting it's like so like yes we do want that seamless experience but i feel like if we have that seamless experience that means that we've lost the war on like having multiple ecosystems being able to choose what we want it yeah that's a really good that's a really good point it's uh to bring it to a movie reference an 80s movie reference i don't know if you've ever seen demolition man but it's 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 when they take the when they take uh and this is a slight spoiler I guess when they take Sylvester Stallone to Taco Bell it's actually a fancy restaurant and it's because the franchise wars were won by Taco Bell so therefore all restaurants are Taco Bell yeah exactly. so you can have you can have restaurants of different type like fast food this that the other thing but it's all Taco Bell mm-hmm. yeah. so that's so like it would be I mean, I mean that was a whole that's obviously a fictional eighties futurism movie but it's sort of the similar idea where it's like all these companies, and this is kind of where it's going with wearables almost to an extent, all these companies are collapsing left, right, and center, or giving up, right? Being like, oh, mm-hmm. I don't want to make that anymore. And so there's like one or two offerings left. And then, you know, if that were to shrink again, now you're really shrunk. Like if Android Wear disappears, the only person left in the game is Samsung. And Samsung has like their Galaxy Watch line, and that's it. Right, well, and then your well, Apple Watch is yeah. your Apple. It's for your Apple, and that's it. Like for the two big, because like these these are two big ecosystems, and then it would have to collapse again. But like the chances of that is very slim. But mm-hmm. it's very interesting. Is I think I think I've evolved my opinion live. <laughs> is I think I I think I just don't. I I say this a lot. I just don't want to be bothered. Like I just I don't want to yeah. be. I want to sit down and like do my work, and like you know whatever like you know because because like when you're like programming or like doing business stuff, you're you're problem solving. I'm I'm fine with that problem solving, but when I sit down, I want to just tell something to turn my TV on and just like play a game or play this movie or something. I just want it to be seamless because I'll use like I'm not calling for, which is a really good point. I'm not calling for Google to make a media server, but I use Plex, and I have no problem with using Plex. Yeah, but so it works like, with yeah. with what's that? Sorry. Well, that's what I mean. Like you're just proving you're proving the the fact that you've you've switched your mindset now like you're okay with the fact that you 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 have to use flex and not use google's like you know renting and watching movie application yeah it's like i I have used it but i'm i'm as long as it's seamless it's like open play store and do this or open uh open play store and do this or open like you know the plex app like who cares like if i have the movie i'll just use the plex app Mm -hmm. if i need to rent the movie or buy the movie i'll just go to the I'll either go, maybe I'll go to Amazon and just like purchase the movie and get the Blu-ray or I'll purchase it or rent it on the Google play store. That's just sort of how I do it. And then I, cr- all of it cast to my Chromecast, all of it does. So there's your like plugin. So that's a, I think, I think more, more than anything, um, I would want, I'd want a convenient experience. Would, would you say but with that then, I, I don't know, I don't know how long you want to ramble on here, but with that then, would you say that like you're, you haven't really entered the smart home game. So mm-hmm. this is like a new horizon for you. And like new horizons are kind of rare in today's tech world because it's normally like changes in the horizon we have, right? Like a new email app, but we've had email apps before. So it's like a new thing for you. When you enter into a new foyer like that, would you say that you personally look for really convenient things? Or like, like what would you, if you, if you tomorrow were like, okay, I want, I have two lamps, two lamps, uh, a thermostat and a leak, leak detector to get. What is your decision-making process in terms of an ecosystem to go into that, like, do you, like what, what, what would you do tomorrow if you had to buy that tomorrow? What would you, what would you start doing to shop? Reviews, price, and performance. Like that's that's what I, when I have to go into an ecosystem blind like that, and I don't know anything, I need a price per performance thing. I'm not gonna buy the most expensive thing. I'm not gonna buy the cheapest thing. I'm usually somewhere in the middle, and I'm gonna look at reviews and a lot of them, like YouTube reviews, written reviews, uh, like buy like Amazon reviews, stuff like that. 
I'll look at multiple reviews and I'll kind of make a smart decision based on that. That's it. Like that I've I've done that for everything that I've ever gotten into, I think. What about what about in this particular case though, and this is what makes this interesting. What if this is like you all leak let, let's hypothetically say all leak detectors are are 2 star out of 5, but you find one leak detector that's 5 out of 5 and all the other and it it's like only on Samsung smart things. So you're like, let's say you decide on your leak detector first. Would you then only look up the reviews of of other smart things? Like, would you keep the ecosystem in mind? Probably. See, that's interesting, right? It's like yeah. when a computer, it's like, as long as I have Windows, I don't care. Mm-hmm. But now it's like, what? Like, I'm not going to buy another type of smart switch. It's not going to happen. I'm going to buy a TP-Link one now. They've got me locked in. Mm-hmm. Because, because, well, first of all, it's like affordable and stuff. I did my research. But I ain't going to be... I'm not downloading another app for smart switches. It's not going to happen. Like I'm going to I'm going to be using the Casa app or the the new Google Home app and that's just what it is. So, yeah. That's super that's a super interesting conversation. I I usually don't don't, don't switch my opinion, but uh live on air, caught on tape, one might say. <laughs> Cuz I'm I'm usually like pretty like strong-headed. Like, no, I'm not I ain't doing that. Why not? Nah. Sure. Nah, I ain't doing that. Mm-hmm. No reason. Just not going to do it. <laughs> As you know, with my uh, all my Microsoft fanboy stuff. So, oh, yeah. <laughs> anyway, um, I think we're good to conclude. Unless you have anything you specifically wanted to discuss. No, I think that's good. All right, awesome. So let's run the conclusion. So uh, many thanks to Azar for joining us today, uh, and uh, thanks for you, thanks to you, the audience, for listening. And make sure you don't miss an episode by subscribing on the platform of your choice. You can also find us on all the socials via at HTML all the things on Facebook and Instagram. You can find us on Twitter via at HTML everything. We're on Medium. We're on GitHub. Uh, we're also on a whole bunch of different uh, podcast platforms, and we have a podcast website as well. So make sure you check those out. Remember, we also have have a patreon so patreon.com slash html all the things and you can check out the tiers if you want to shout out on the show there's a tier for that and there's also another tier on there so whichever you'd like to purchase and uh, feel free to leave a comment or a review on the platform that you are listening to this on and we are signing off